In my experience, it seems that discussions about off-grid water systems only take place in niche communities of homesteaders or preppers. If you were to bring it up in a normal workplace conversation, for example, I guarantee you'd get at least one set of raised, what a weirdo, eyebrows. But considering just how crucial water is to life itself, it's amazing to me that we don't talk about it more. The average American is totally comfortable using a staggering 80 to 100 gallons of water a day. But we're rarely taught to think about where it comes from, how it gets to us, how sustainable and dependable the system actually is that brings it to us. It's easy to depend on the grid to supply your water, but it's a huge gamble that some of us will never risk for our families. The truth really is, having a safe, reliable, and independent source of water is not just a backup plan. It's an absolute necessity for survival and should be one of the first considerations taken when planning the homestead or honestly any home in my opinion. Now I don't need to tell you this, if you're watching this video, you already care about that. Even if it's just out of curiosity, you probably want to know what your options are for taking your water supply off the out-of-your-control grid. So what should you consider? Does your property have to have a pond? Do you have the option of using lots of heavy rainfall? What systems are out there and how do they work? Well, the answer to these questions is dependent on your own land, your climate, and your water use. But the general answer is that the best system is a diverse one. If you're an investor, you've probably heard the term diversifying your portfolio. But far more important than the diversification of stocks, it's diversification in this very basic necessity of life. When it comes to securing water for your family, you must always be able to plan a diversification of your water portfolio. Have more than one system so that you'll never be left high and dry. As a homesteader who uses off-grid water daily, this plan is something that I both know dearly and care about very deeply. So I want to share with you what I've used to get my own systems online to help you make the best decisions you can for your land and your family. Now for the record, this article is not meant to be a how-to on building your own off-grid water system. That journey depends on your specific land and needs and requires a fair deal of very specialized information. Instead, think of this video as a collection basket of many resources that I've used and referenced in my own off-grid water endeavors. So I hope it can bring some of this very worthy information into your hands instead. Now let's talk about some off-grid sources of water. Available off-grid water basically comes in three forms. Water from below the ground, surface water, and collected precipitation. I would recommend having some sort of access to all three sources of water if you can. It may take years of work to get it all in place, but when it comes to something as important as water, I think it's worth the investment of time. Now, number one, a well. Wells tap into deep groundwater anywhere from 200 to 300 feet or even deeper below the surface. If you have an existing well on your property, you have a fantastic potential for getting a good source of water that's off the grid. You can convert an electric pump to run on solar or wind power too, or you can even switch it to a manual pump. If you're game for it, you can totally supply the entirety of the water you need for your daily household use from a manual pump, but I would strongly recommend also working in rainwater catchment, which I'll talk about more later. If you do that, the manual well and the rainwater catchment can work in harmony with one another. You can always get water even if the rain barrels are low, of course, but in times of plenty, your hard-working arms can get a break. Well water is usually a reliable source of fresh water, and a deep enough well won't freeze on you in the winter because the groundwater is insulated from the surface temperature. In in ideal circumstances, it should be really pretty clean, although I always recommend filtering water before consuming it. Of course, getting water up from the ground requires energy, whether that's your arms or some other alternative means of powering a pump, and the associated infrastructure. Drilling for groundwater may be more of a gamble in some areas than others. You never really know when you're going to hit it. Additionally, it's costly to have a well installed. It'll run you a few thousand dollars at least, but in my mind that expenses are worth it. It's also possible that your groundwater could be contaminated by nearby pollutants, especially if you live in an area where fracking is common. Number two, rain catchment. Free water from the sky has been a gift to humankind since the beginning of time. You can take advantage of this opportunity by collecting rainwater for your homestead's daily use. Even if your land has dry spells during the summer, you can still store up spring rains for later use, which gives you a reliable source of water potentially at all times. We've got an earlier video about the basics of rainwater collecting here. It can give you a good introduction to some of the options available for this underappreciated resource. Rainwater is a soft, usually very clean source of water, and it's free of the chemicals that are present in city water and the sometimes excess minerals that are present in groundwater. Harvesting rainwater for impervious surfaces on your land relieves some of the pressure to supplies your needs from underground aquifers and instead allows them to be replenished naturally. A rainwater catchment system is simple to implement and generally very clean, absolutely free, and easy to set up on any roof in your property. Do note, however, that asphalt roofs and treated wood shake roofs are capable of leaching chemicals into, into rainwater. A metal, slate, untreated shake, or tile roof might be a better choice. Now, in some areas, rainwater collection is restricted. It's a crime in my book since the impact made by household collection is absolutely negligible in the long run, but it might be something you have to take into consideration. Number three, a pond. 
A pond on your property is more than just a playground for ducks or dran dancing dragonflies. It's also your personal reservoir and a source of backup water. Now, of course, I wouldn't recommend using a pond as your primary source of water, but having a huge amount of stored water on your property is a potentially life-saving resource that can benefit every living thing on the homestead. A pond is easy to maintain if it's already on your property. It naturally fills in with every rainstorm and in the meantime provides a habitat to a huge host of creatures and plants. Of course, pond water requires extensive cleaning and filtering to be turned into potable water for human consumption. And it's not easy to move water from point A to point B without a pump system. And honestly, lugging five gallon buckets up the banks can get arduous. Number four, a spring. Old time spring houses and the allure of clean, icy cold water bubbling from between rocks is the stuff of homesteader daydreams. Now, some of you might not have a spring on your property. I don't, and so therefore I have very little experience with them. But I hope that this article can give you a good launching point if you're blessed enough to have one of these gifts on your land. Pros of springs is that they're often very clean water, freely flowing from the ground and requiring little care once the infrastructure is built around them to protect them. Springs require quite a lot of initial work to harness, direct, and turn into a reliable source of water however. They may not be located in a spot that's convenient to your daily activities, and they're capable of being contaminated by your neighbor's activities. So let's talk now about systems for utilizing all these different sources of off-grid water. In an off-grid situation, using the natural design of the earth is your best bet for long-term successes and sustainability. In the case of moving water to where you want it, you can't get any more logical or off-grid than just using gravity to move that liquid life to the places where it will sustain you. Ancient Romans knew the power of using gravity, that's how their aqueducts work. You can take a page from their book by implementing gravity-fed systems on your homestead. There are surprisingly few instructions for implementing a gravity-fed system to be found online. So I heartily recommend buying Art Ludwig's book, Water Storage Tanks, Cisterns, Aquifers, and Ponds as a fantastic resource on this entire subject. All the storage methods that I list on this, in this video are given the royal treatment in his thorough, experience-based write-up. Number one, rain barrels. These can be bought pre-made, often overpriced, or recycled from old 55 gallon food storage barrels. If you're just getting your feet wet with the idea of off-grid water, try installing one as a weekend project and get the journey going. Of course, rain barrels can be installed anywhere there's a downspout, giving you instant storage of rainwater with every storm. They're small enough to be used in the city without making too much of a statement, and they can also exert a decent amount of pressure if they're raised up on a platform. Now, of course, many rain barrels are limited to 55 gallons if you use the typical size, and that results in a lot of potential water being lost during a rain event. If you make a daisy chain of rain barrels, you can expand your harvesting potential greatly. Alternatively, using IBC totes can give you the opportunity to catch 275 or 330 gallons. Number two, cisterns. Cisterns are a time-honored way to store water and have been used for millennia. They may be located above or below the ground, depending on your setup, and they can be made out of a ton of different materials. They could be hewn out of stone, shaped out of metal, or even sculpted out of ferro-cement. For an in-depth explanation of their form and function, take the time to read through this website that I've linked below, and then buy the Art Ludwig book I mentioned earlier. Cisterns can create off-grid passive water pressure if they're located at an elevation higher than your tap. If having a gravity-fed system is important to your water plan, calculating the precise location for your cistern is crucial before you ever buy the first bag of cement or turn the first shovel full of dirt. The formula? Every 2.3 feet in elevation adds one PSI of pressure, or every meter of elevation change adds 10 kilopascals of pressure. Cisterns can hold thousands of gallons of water, turning a single heavy rainstorm into the majority of your water for the season. Cisterns can be freeze-proof if buried in the ground or if they're massive enough. Now, of course, cisterns require intense construction and installation, as well as a good understanding of your terrain. They can sink into the ground if installed on fill dirt. Due to their size, they need a lot of space. And if you plan on having water pressure, you also need that big elevation difference on your land. Another way to get water to you is lots of bucket lugging. Explaining this one, I hope, is not necessary. Much of the world still moves their water around in buckets, and as someone who currently does my fair share of bucket lugging, I can assure you that while it's hard work, it is possible. Cancel that gym membership, you're going to get fit off-grid style. Now the pros of bucket lugging are that the system can't break down, you just need to get a new bucket. But it also requires a certain degree of physical fitness, and the buckets have to be kept clean. Make sure to use food grade five gallon buckets if this is the route you choose. Now let's talk about when you don't need to filter water. This may seem like a silly topic, but when you're building your off-grid water system, it's an important factor to consider. Not all water needs to be cleaned, filtered, or purified before use. To do it unnecessarily is a waste of your time and resources. This, again, is why having a multifaceted system is so important. It allows you to make choices for your specific needs, decide what water needs to be cleaned for human use, and don't worry about the rest. So when it comes to watering livestock and plants, they can do just fine with raw water, as it were. If you use rain barrels, you can use that to provide for your animals and plants. If you live in an area with city water, this might be a bigger boon to the living thing 
things that you care for than you realize. City water is often chlorinated and fluoridated, and both chemicals can have detrimental on your effects on your plants when you water them with water straight from the tap. You can also use unfiltered rain barrel water, and occasionally unfiltered well water when the rain barrels are low, to wash clothing. It doesn't make sense to take impeccably clean water and then immediately toss your mud-caked pants or reusable diapers in it. If you use a clothesline, you may already know that direct sunlight helps to disinfect laundry. And let's be honest, sometimes we might not get the laundry in before a surprise rainstorm hits and then the laundry gets a rainwater bonus rinse anyway. The laundry item I would recommend taking special care with is your kitchen dishcloths. Just scrub and boil those and get them really clean. Now let's talk about household uses of off-grid water. The easiest and probably most short-sighted way to do off-grid water is just to figure out some way to get your well to provide the same amount of water you used when you were on the grid. A solar-powered and wind-powered well or generator-powered one when conditions aren't right might allow you to continue living what some would call a normal life of flush toilets, plentiful showers, washing machines, chugging in the basement. It'll work until it doesn't and then you're in a bind for sure. The truth is, getting an off-grid system into place should cause some lifestyle adjustments and overhauls. If you're starting to switch with a family, make sure that everyone is on board because the change will require everyone to work together. When every gallon counts, the old 80 to 100 gallons per person mentality really can't be an option. Now, this isn't meant to sound like an indictment at all. It's an encouragement to embark on the transition to off-grid water use with an excited mind and a willing spirit. If you're willing to go off-grid, you gotta have to commit and you also need to give yourself time to relearn how to live. I know that switching your conventionally raised mind for how you currently live to an off-grid way will take time and a little bit of struggle, but I made it through, I waste much less water, and so can you. So here's a list of some of the things that you can change for both the more sustainable and better and that might help you with your own transition. Number one, let's talk about toilets. If you take a step back from convention and look at our society's current means of managing human waste, it's insane. We take clean, potable water, fill an indoor bowl with it, and then fill that bowl with urine and feces before flushing it away to be mixed with industrial waste and chemically processed, and then we just hope it's clean enough when we send it back into the waterways. If you're taking your water usage back into your own hands, you can do better than this. Though you can easily pressurize a system to run a toilet, they can fill slowly with as little as one to two PSI. I would recommend a composting toilet system. It's a lot easier to deal with, believe it or not. Instead of having to scrub a nasty, smelly toilet every week, composting toilets are usually odorless and waterless. It doesn't need to be hooked up to the grid and also provides you with an opportunity to compost and reinvest the nutrients from your own waste back into your own soil rather than shipping off to some debatably dependable sewer. Then, you can also think about separating your feces from your urine. Not only will this make the compost easier to handle, but it can give you a new resource. Urine actually comes out sterile and is an imminently useful material when not contaminated with other waste. The book Liquid Gold illustrates many well-researched uses for urine on the homestead and is certainly worth those the read for those willing to give it a try. There's urine diverting composting toilets that could also be a, a useful addition to the homestead if you're serious about this practice. Number two, showers. The pressure usually required to run a shower head is in the ballpark of 20 PSI. Although many of us have grown accustomed to the much higher 55 to 100 PSI, which is the typical maximum pressure offered by municipal services. In order to achieve that amount of pressure, your cistern of water would need to be installed installed more than 100 feet above your home. This is highly unlikely. So you might need to face the possibility of changing your bathing practices and adapting to a life with low water pressure. This might be a hard one for you to give up at first. I know a lot of us do good thinking in the shower with endless, thoughtless streams of water running all the while while we think. But I want to let you know that it is possible to totally and satisfactorily convert your bathing needs to the contents of a two-gallon bucket or even less. Give yourself the time to learn the art of the sponge bath and revolutionize your water usage. I think the the key to successful sponge bathing is threefold. First, go easy on the soap. Just reserve it for smelly areas. You only need hot water and a washcloth everywhere else. Second, wash yourself at the end of every day. It's a pleasant nighttime ritual that every homesteader needs to do anyway with all the outdoor work we do. Third, stop using shampoo for your hair. It lightens the chemical load in the resulting gray water, and you may find that your scalp will become healthier since quitting the chemicals in shampoo. Try experimenting with the commonly touted baking soda and vinegar solution method. It'll take some time to transition to a new self-care routine, but if you're in it to win it, you'll figure it out. Number three, laundry. If you take the plunge and switch your pump to a manual system, you may also have to face the music that the washing machine you depended on has to go. That can be a hard pill to swallow at first because hand washing a whole family's laundry is an intimidating prospect. But you can learn through many trials, experimentations, and errors how to wash clothes like everyone used to do before washing machines came on the scene. I gotta tell you, it's not that bad. There are many systems available to the off-grid launderer, such as the Lavario, the Wonderwash, or even gasoline-powered washing machines. But the most effective clean I've 
I've ever been able to manage, even cleaner than with a washing machine, has been with a homemade washing stick, a five gallon bucket, and a washing plunger. This system is my go-to. The big key to keeping laundry manageable when you're manually washing off-grid laundry is to make sure the clothes that go in the hamper actually deserve to be there. You're not gross if you wear the same shirt you wore yesterday today. As long as it doesn't smell bad, it's still good in my book. And if the pants you got muddy yesterday are just gonna get muddy again today, do they need to be washed again or can't they wait until the project is done? Number four, eating and drinking. I would recommend sending all the water that you personally consume through drink or cooking through a Berkey filter. Once upon a time, raw rainwater and raw river water may have been safe to drink, but those days are lost in the haze of modern industry, pharmaceutical laced waterways, and groundwater contaminants. You'll likely usually use well water, but you can use rainwater too in a Berkey. There are many ways to purify and, fu and filter rainwater. This website that we've linked here details the various UV-based mechanical and chemical ways to go about it. Now I'm not big on plugging products, but I do make an exception for the Berkey system of water filtering. You could pour hideous pond water through these things that'll make a terrible mess to have to clean up afterward, and have safe water to drink. Another filtering system to try experimenting with is a biosand filter. Now as much as I like my Berkey, you know from this article I don't like the idea of being entirely dependent on a singular purchase product. The biosand filter is a means to naturally remove a ton of contaminants using things you can find on your land. And I love that. It's another means of building redundancy into your water supply to ensure you can always have what you need. Number five, dishes. Those old farmhouse sinks knew what they were doing with their deep pockets and two sides. Washing dishes by hand and with off-grid water is a breeze when you fill both sides of the sink. Make one side the soap side, the other side the rinse side, and you're well on your way to having dinner cleaned up without wasting tons of rotting water. Number six, gray water. Managing water off the grid also includes managing the water after you're done using it. First, make sure the water has had its full use, and then cascade the uses, if you can. Start with clean water where it counts, and then allow the resulting slightly dirty water to accomplish tasks that don't need impeccable water. For example, if you used a pot of water to incubate yogurt, heat that same water up to wash the dishes once the yogurt is done. Or you can use the rinse water from one bucket of laundry to be the wash water for the next bucket. Or direct used hand washing water to flush a toilet. The longer you work with off-grid water, the more ways you'll figure out how to innovate its use to benefit your home to the max. Once you're finally done with it, gray water can be handled in several different ways. But the most important thing is to handle it immediately. Gray water can't be stored longer than 24 hours, or the bacteria will multiply and turn it into black water in no time. Your final plan for gray water management could even be a greenhouse attached to the front of your home, if you're planning to build one. The gray water could be sent to the plants there to provide them with a nutrient-rich source of water and nutrition. Or you could work in mulch basins surrounded by gardens and do the laundry area there. There are many ways to redirect gray water to your benefit. So if this plan sounds appealing to you, check out these books. Create an oasis with a gray water, a wonderful, indispensable resource for making use of gray water in a huge array of outside applications, or Michael Reynolds' Earthship series, the go-to resources for implementing gray water reuse in an in-home greenhouse design. All four of these books discuss incredibly detailed, innovative ways to route your gray water into planters, gardens, and created wetlands, and to make your land incredibly lush and productive and waste-free. Now, off-grid water is not just a topic for prepper forums. It's a way of life that I love, even with all the immense amount of work involved. I hope more of you can join us in declaring water freedom. I know that that was a lot of information, so thanks for hanging on for the ride. Now, if you know of any other worthy resources for the intrepid off-grid water adventurers, please leave them in the comments below. Those of us embarking on this crazy adventure of experimentation and freedom always welcome new ideas.